Amato Yukateru's parents got divorced some years ago. Ever since then, Amano has been forced to live a lonely life away from people and friends. He, however, developed a hobby of being a spectator and recording random occurrences in his phone's diary to keep the boredom at bay. He even created imaginary friends, Muru Muru, and a god, Deus, in his mind, thinking they were nothing but a fiction of his own imagination. Yukateru quickly discovers that the god he seemingly created in his mind may not be so false after all. In the first scene, Yukateru wakes up to a normal day. He preps up and gets to school as usual. After some classes, he gets up and continues moving on his own, recording whatever information he could in his handheld digital diary. After school, Yuki returns home, gets on his bed, and covers it with his bedspread to get into his mind. In his mind, Yuki summons the god of time and space, Duas Ex Machina, and his servant, Maru Maru. Dias tells Yuki he's trying to organize some casualties while he was away. When he's done, Duas asks if Yuki was lonely. Yuki gives him the obvious answer and Duas decides to do something about it. He sends a message to Duas's phone in the real world and tells Yuki to participate in the game, that it's an interesting one. Yuki just ignores the game and thinks it's all in his imagination. That very night, a random lady runs back home from her pursuer. Unfortunately for her, she couldn't find her keys in time. The pursuers catch up to her and end her life. The next day, Yuki wakes up to find several messages on his phone. After reading them, he finds out the messages may be records of everything that's to happen that day. Yuki can't believe his eyes and just keeps on living his life normally. Things, however, get very real very fast when the occurrences of that day happen exactly as recorded in the diary. By the end of school, Yuki is very convinced that the diary tells his future. This new discovery led him to avoid being bullied by the school bullies. Once he gets back home, he asks Duas for an explanation. Firstly, Duas tells him he's the true god of space and time, not just a figment of his imagination. He also tells Yuki that his phone is now a future diary and must be protected at all costs. If the phone breaks or dies out, Yuki would die in real life. Yuki gets back to school the next day and adapts to his new future diary. He avoids the same bullies again and refuses to worry much about the dangers of the diary. In the class after recess, Yuki's homeroom teacher, Hadayama, gives them a hard test to do. Yuki does it perfectly and gets a very weird sensation about the shyest and cutest girl in the class, Kasai Yuno. After school that day, Yuki gets a very weird message nicknamed, Dead End. Yuno appears to him and tells him all there's to know about the future diary. Spooks Yuki so much that he runs all the way back to his house. He gets into the elevator, thinking he was safe from Yuno, only to have her join him later on. Yuki immediately brings out his darts to injure Yuno, but she kisses him and tells him the major reason why they're there. She tells him about the serial killer that's been ravaging the town and says he's down in his building waiting for Yuki to arrive so he can finish him off. Yuno takes Yuki to the roof of his building and prepares him to face the criminal. Once the criminal arrives, he finds nobody on the roof. Unknown to him, Yuki and Yuno were hiding just out of his sight. The criminal brings out his diary and Yuki throws his darts at it and breaks it. Almost immediately, the criminal dies. Yuki gets back home and challenges Duas for making him go through such a horrible game. Dias opens his eyes and takes him to another dimension to introduce him to others like him, who own a future diary. Aside from Yuki, there are 11 other future diary owners living amongst normal humans. Dias explains all the specifics about the diary, not leaving out the dead-end tournament. Once he's done with the explanation, he invites them all to play a game of battle royale. The last man standing would get the god's throne. Every other future diary owner promises to take out the first, which is Yuki, with a few of them vowing to protect him. Furthermore, Yuno is texting Yukiteru for the 40th time, which makes Yuki wonder how she got his cell phone number in the first place. Yuki wants to talk to Yuno about what happened the day before at school, but Yuno says she needs to go to the gym first and will make time for him later. That night, Mining Yuryu enters the classroom and inquires of Yuki about Takao Hayama the third diary user's whereabouts. Yuki responds to this shock and rapidly grabs his diary to check his changed future, confirming Mining's suspicion about Yuki being first. Meanwhile, Yuno, who was changing in the girl's changing room for the gym, saw her Yukateru diary change its future, which prompted her to sprint towards Yuki and Minning. She arrives just in time and tries to hit Mining with a fire extinguisher. 
but Minning avoids her attack and flees through the window. Minning then reveals that she has planted bombs and claymores throughout the school and is holding everyone hostage. She ravages the school, detonating bombs all over the place in an attempt to kill Yuki, leaving Yuno as Yuki's only option for survival. As we can see, they are constantly on the move, evading the bombs with the help of Yuki's random diary, but Yuki is caught up in one of the explosions. He becomes depressed when he discovers his diary is only about events around him and not about himself. However, Yuno reveals her Yukateru diary's ability to predict all that involves Yuki and says he will survive because their diaries together form an invincible duo. Yuno then suggests that they find their teachers and classmates because she believes they will assist them. However, it is later revealed that Mining secretly asked Yuki's classmates to bring Yuki to her in exchange for their freedom. When Yuki is brought before Mining, he feels betrayed and scared because he thought they would be his friends. Mining then places his diary in the middle of a minefield between her and Yuki, along with a bomb. Yuno then realizes that all of the students are Yuki's enemies because friends would never try to kill him, so she goes on a rampage and runs through the school towards Menning, detonating all of the motion sensor bombs and slaughtering the students. The fourth diary owner, Kurusu Kigo, then makes his move, shooting Mining's hair to get her attention and revealing his case diary to Yuki. Mining then demands that fourth kill Yuki and then himself, or else she will detonate all of the remaining bombs. Fourth shoots at Yuki's head, apologizing for the change in circumstances. Yuno leaps through a window and attacks Knight, prompting Fourth to advise Yuki to flee and retrieve his diary. Yuno guides him through the minefield while Fourth shoots mining to prevent her from manually detonating mines. Unfortunately, Yuno is unable to use her diary because Ninth and Fourth have run out of bullets. Mining, on the verge of detonating, is then hit by school books and other school equipment, such as pencils and fiddle cases thrown by all the remaining students. After that, Yuki grabs his dart and tries to pierce and destroy her diary after she detonates her last mine too late. Minin reacts quickly and saves her diary but gets her left eye pierced. Fourth, claiming that Minin has lost, is surprised when Minin reveals the name and ability of her diary, the Escape Diary. She then activates a smoke screen concealed beneath her dress and flees on a motorcycle. Finally, fourth, second, and first band together to eliminate the other diary users and, as fourth puts it, put an end to this stupid game. However, Yukiteru Amano and Yuno Gasai meet with Keigo Kurusu, who warns them of Mining Yuryu's continued danger. To entice Mining, Yuki and Yuno are sent on a date to the local amusement park, much to Yuki's chagrin. Yuki quietly observes Yuno's behavior throughout the day, realizing that despite being his stalker, she can act like a normal girl. The two go on several rides, including a walk through Ghost Train that both of them find terrifying. Yuno eventually drags Yuki into a pool park. Yuno stops Yuki to ask a nearby attendant to get her top. Yuno is knocked down by another swimmer, sending her flying into Yuki's arms, much to Yuki's surprise. Yuki floats away in shock as the attendant retrieves Yuno's top. Later, Yuno notices the planetarium and suggests going there next, only for Yuki to dismiss the idea and rush away. Yuki asks Yuno on the Ferris wheel why she is always following him around. Yuno responds by questioning why Yuki avoided the planetarium, mentioning how he wanted to go stargazing. Yuki accuses Yuno of reading his diary, but Yuno leaps to his feet and tells her he told her. In a flashback, Yuki and Yuno are shown sitting in a classroom together a year ago. Yuno stares blankly at a piece of paper on which she is supposed to write down her future goals. Yuno notices Yuki writing something and approaches him, learning Yuki wishes to go stargazing. He explains that his parents recently divorced and that he is now unable to travel. Yuki goes to rub out his wish, but Yuno stops him by offering to become his bride and go stargazing with him. Yuki, believing Yuno is joking, responds that they can go when they are older. In the present, Yuki is taken aback by Yuno's revelation. When it starts raining that night, Yuki and Yuno buy an umbrella and walk home. Meanwhile, Mining flees the police, abandoning her gothic Lolita dress, and is haunted by her past, when her family was killed during a war-torn tour of the Middle East. Mining attempts to flee the police, but her hiding places are continually compromised. However, Yamatsu Hirasaka, a mysterious man, appears and takes Mining to his log cabin. He administers medicine to Mining, but he has actually drugged her. Yomatsu snaps his finger and reveals Mining's diary is made of wood, 
explaining she was hypnotized. Yomatsu is revealed to be dressed in a mask and a spandex suit. Mining, unable to move, can only watch as Yamatsu interrogates her about Yuki while pulling out her punctured eye. Yuki and Yuno arrive at Yuno's house, with Yuno inviting Yuki inside. Yuki discovers that the power has gone out, and the only food available is an apple, which Yuno goes to peel. Yuki, perplexed, goes in search of the restroom, following the directions in his diary. He comes across a taped-off room and makes a brief note of it in his diary. After that, Yuki goes to open the door, curious about how much he can change the future, just as every diary holder's diary blasts out a flash of light. Meanwhile, Yuki opens the door to find the room filled with bloodstains and three corpses on the floor. Help me, screams a bloody message on the wall. The causality continuum begins to shift quickly, with Duas Ex Machina expressing his delight that he chose Yuki as his favorite to win, astounded that he has altered the entire planned timeline of the survival game. Yuki is shocked, and Yuno appears behind him in tears, asking why he opened the door, as her happy end in her diary vanishes. After that, Yuki runs all the way home from Yuno's house, locking the front door and collapsing in a heap. Yuki looks up when he hears the letterbox open, and sees Yuno's psychotic eyes staring down at him as she bids him good night. Yukiteru Amano has a sleepless night and considers approaching Kego Kurusu about the bodies he discovered at the Gasai residence, but backs down when he discovers Yuno is watching his every move. However, Kurusu takes the two teenagers to the Onkata temple the next day, where mining Yuriyu is suspected of being held after her kidnapping. Tsubaki Kasugano, head priestess, grants them an audience and reveals herself to be the sixth diary owner. She freely informs them that her clairvoyance diary records her followers' future observations and has set a dead end for her. She offers a deal. In exchange for Yukiteru's protection, she will hand over Yuryu to Kurusu. Despite Yuno's open disdain for the idea, Yukiteru is coerced into agreeing. Tsubaki advises the boy not to become too attached to Yuno in the evening. Her futon catches fire, and her followers rush into the room. They pour fuel on the flames and hack at each other with axes, as if in a trance. Meanwhile, Yuno begs Yuki to leave Tsubaki behind, but Yukiteru recalls the nightmare scene in Yuno's house and dismisses her place. He breaks into Tsubaki's quarters to save her, just as Kurusu repairs the sprinkler system, putting out the fire. Six realizes her followers have been mass hypnotized after reading several reports in her diary about strange figures seen around the temple. Yamatsu Hirasaka, somewhere in the temple's bowels, compares the diary's weaknesses to a chained-up Ryu, comparing their strengths and weaknesses to a rock-paper-scissors-esque cycle. He puts on his red eyeball mask and suits up, proclaiming himself a hero of justice, but Yuryu chastises him for his arrogance, assuming he'll meet his match with Yuno Gasai. Second, as if on cue, correctly guesses that the mangled followers surrounding her, Yukiteru, and Tsubaki are only pretending to be dead, and completes the job with an axe. She smiles as she offers her love a choice, follow her and live, or stay with Tsubaki and die. Tsubaki Kasugano recalls her childhood as a figurehead for the Omakata cult on her parents' orders. She was content and happy until they were killed in a car accident. Fonatsu, the second in command, persuaded her followers to cleanse themselves of sin by raping the temple maiden. After that, Sixth endured two years as a sex slave, with only a red handball for company. However, it vanished one day, claimed by the invisible world, signaling the beginning of her slow descent into despair and madness. Minihi, Tsubaki joins Yukiteru Amano and Yuno in their escape from the temple in the present. Kigo Kurusu summons backup and looks for mining Yuriyu. The terrorist is listening to Yomatsu Hirasaka's justice diary, which informs him of villainous misdeeds, whether minor or major. Twelfth arms himself with an explosive after hearing the future change on his voice recorder and lets Yuryu go free. Kurusu apprehends and interrogates her shortly after, informing Yukiteru of Twelfth's blindness. Meanwhile, the cultist hypnosis has worn off, and Tsubaki suggests they apprehend the intruder. Yuno appears to enter a trance, intent on killing Six, much to Yukiteru's chagrin. Twelfth then makes a dramatic Sente-style entrance with four decoys, cornering first, second, and six. He tells Yukiteru to leave after announcing his intention to defeat Sabaki, but the boy hesitates. Twelfth and his decoys attack, but he is defeated when Yuno tricks him into using his superior hearing. 
Tsubaki abandons her sympathetic persona and pursues Yukateru and Yuno when the latter overexerts herself. Second cuts off the girl's hand after she taunts Yuno by crudely kissing Yukateru. Yuno allows her love to flee, and Tsubaki uses her as bait to entice Yukateru back in, intending to subject her to the torture she endured. Yukateru recalls his date with Yuno, discovers six old red handball in the temple grounds, and sets out to save second. Yukateru alters their observations in Tsubaki's diary by throwing the handball over them and seizes the opportunity to nail the scroll with a dart. Six laments the fact that her ball was returned to her far too late before she died. In the back of a police van, Yukateru and Yuno kiss. However, Kurusu strikes a deal with Yuryu, releasing her on unspecified terms. Yuno enters Yukateru's home to begin the episode. Meanwhile, in the Sakuremi railway station, Yuki is seen waiting to pick up his mother because one of her co-workers was killed during the Omakata cult event, and she volunteered to care for her colleague's child, Reisa Kuju. Yuki's mother, a game designer, took a few days off from her job. However, Yuno breaks into Yuki's home and makes various preparations so that his mother will accept her as Yuki's lover as Yuki waits for his mother at the Sakuremi City train station. Afterwards, the breach is discovered by Yuki and his mother when they get home. Yuki runs to his bedroom to send her away or hide her from his mother after reading in his diary that Yuno was the one who had committed this crime. When his mother enters his room, he locks Yuno in his closet. Despite everything, Yuno and his mother eventually cross paths. It appears that they get along well with one another. They discuss marriage and Yuki while eating dinner. Yuno is quite displeased when Ri Amano shows him numerous infant pictures of Yuki after supper. Later, a taxi delivers the child of Ri's deceased colleague to their house. Raizuk made his first killing attempt after being introduced to them by Yuki's mother, making it appear as though he fell while holding a pair of scissors with Yuno in mind. Fortunately, Yuno anticipated this and used a cushion to deflect the murder attempt. As a result, Rizup responded by using the restroom. By reading his journal, the youngster Reisu Kaoju reveals himself there as the fifth diary owner. After revealing himself to be the fifth diary user at the end of the last episode, Reisu Kaoju changes his strategy. Since Yukateru and Yuno's future diaries work well together and his hypervision diary only contains three entries per day, he reconsiders his choice, he reviews his scientific and medical equipment in the bathroom for potential plans before leaving the room. However, a substantial lunchtime meal is consumed by Yuki, Yuno, Ri Amano, and Reisuk. In an effort to assist, Reisuk mentions that he created the salad. Ri answers the call when it rings and steps out of the kitchen. Yuki quizzes Reisuk on his entrance as lunch proceeds. After that, the action is shifted to a recent flashback where it becomes clear why Risuk invited Ri to assist with the salad preparation. He actually poisoned the tomatoes. As Yuki was going to devour a tomato that Yuno had rolled on her fork, she stopped him and objected to the weight disparity. As soon as Yuno realized that Risuk's plan had failed, she took the salad bowls belonging to her and Yuki away. Yuno is still unsure of what exactly is wrong. The future has changed, he discovers after checking his diary. Afterwards, Yuno meets Raisuk and demands an apology for throwing away the salad. She pats his head and adds, hopes that the guy who killed his parents is arrested soon, which helps him feel a little better. He gives a crazy smile as she leaves and declares that he enjoys her company. But in the restroom, he switches to a different strategy and destroys the washing machine's wiring. He configures the lines to build up power more than 50 million peers, which can be fatal because he is an actually intelligent diary user also, he adds salt to the water in the bathtub to boost conductivity and produce a deadly trap. Later, as Yucky is blow-drying his hair, he remembers the difference between the future and the past. He realizes with horror that the shift must have occurred because a diary user is around. The future changes once more, this time revealing that Yuno will be electrocuted at 7.21 p.m. Rizuk enters while carrying the aforementioned wires and wearing a pair of rubber gloves to prevent him from killing himself with his own scheme. As Yuno is in the middle of getting ready for a bath, when Yucky realizes he won't arrive in time, he searches for whatever he can use to stop the electroshock. As we can see, Yucky turns on the hairdryer on Turbo just as Rizuk is about to drop wires into the water, disrupting the child's plan and triggering an electricity drop. When Yucky enters the restroom to check on Yuno, he runs out giggling and completely nude. 
In the meantime, Kigo Kurusu sends a message to Mining Yuriu, suggesting that the child in the Amano residence is the fifth diary user. She knows Yuki will be hesitant to murder a child. To Yuki's discomfort, it is true that Yuno would prefer to kill Raisu in order to put an end to the craziness. Rizuk leaves the bedroom as they are having a chat, claiming that they will never discover it, and he takes his luggage with him. As the hunt is still ongoing, Yuno hasn't changed her decision. When they were looking for the diary in the backyard, Yuno saw Raisuk giving her a psychotic grin. When Yuno leaves, Yuki observes the convenience store the kid visited with Ri the day before. Meanwhile, she had actually given up on the idea and started pursuing Raisuk with a hammer through the house. Yuno unintentionally knocked Ri out with the mallet when she went to check on her while Ri was ignorant of what was going on. Yuki is deeply saddened by this. However, Yuno agrees to Yuki's proposal after stitching Ri and putting her on the floor to recuperate, and she then proceeds to sit in silence on the kitchen table to look for the diary. Risuk sends his diary to the Amano home, and as soon as the doorbell rings, he shows up at the door and grabs the parcel. She discovers after entering a trance and reading Risuk's thoughts. Yuki, however, dashes in to steal a package and starts opening it. But Yuno warns him not to open it because it's already too late after consulting her diary. As the deadly gas fills the space, Yuki passes unconscious. Reizu teases the two while dunning a gas mask and explains what transpired. It was a trap and one side actually did have access to the diary. As the murderous youngster starts the game of hide and seek, Yuno and Yuki flee to the restroom. If Yuno finds Reizu, he will give her the gas countermeasure and she will win. In order to prevent Ri from being poisoned, she was brought outside. Meanwhile, the child used many traps and noisy toys in the violent game, including the enticing laughing toy, pinheads on the doorpost, and tape on the windows. She finally manages to get him to the ground floor. He also dropped a light bulb to electrocute Yuno and turned on the faucet to make water flow on the stairwell. She then tumbles, and Risu prepares to syringe inject something into her. At that point, Yuki pokes Reisuk in the right shoulder before approaching Yuno and giving her a mouth-to-mouth -mouth kiss. Yuki passes out as the child withdraws to the bottom of the stairway. Yuno explains her motive for stabbing Reisuk as simple love for Yuki. Reisuk receives the remedy after Yuno's knife pierces her chest. He warns her, however, that if she and Yuki continue in their current directions, they would eventually kill one another before disappearing altogether. Yuno then attempts to administer the cure to Yuki but she passes out. At that precise moment, Minning shows there and administers the remedy. Speaking to Duas Ex Machina, an unidentified diary owner asks to give his journal to another person. After that, on his route to his new school, Yukiteru Amano notices a boy with white hair standing back and watching him. Yuno Visai advises him to conceal his diary in order to avoid drawing the notice of the other owners. Meanwhile, Kosaka Uji torments Yukiteru in school but is restrained by classmates Hinata Hino and Mao Nanosaka, despite the fact that there have been killings in the neighborhood. Yukateru quickly befriends the three, and after school, the group visits a park. Although having a different opinion, Yuno supports Yukateru and his buddies. However, the future shifts in first and second's diaries as Hinata rushes off on her own and looks to be pursued by multiple dogs. The group discovers what appears to be Hinata's corpse after that. They are aided in fleeing to a park observatory by the white-haired boy from earlier, who introduces himself as Aruakais. Meanwhile, Karyudo Tsukishima, the proprietor of Tsukishima Kennels, serves a meal to his dogs and keeps tabs on their whereabouts throughout the park. He seems to have given his daughter access to his journal. Akis admits that she has been studying Yukiteru's role in recent events like the Omkata incident, the bombing of his old school by the ninth, and the killings committed by three. The dogs intensify their attack, and Yukiteru, out of options, uses his diary to help the group keep the hounds out. As we can see that, Mal puts a knife to Yukiteru's throat after the dogs appear to give up and takes away his diary. After pretending to be dead, Hanada reappears and identifies herself as a diary owner. She claims that she solely wants Akaisa's diaries and has no business with first or second. After that, Karyudo Tsukishima informs his daughter Hinata Hino in a flashback that he is to blame for the most recent killings. He explains his involvement in the survival game by saying that he needs Hinata's assistance in order to succeed in Duos Ex Machina and reunite his family. 
Tsukishima believes the child is a competitor diary user since Aruakase has been spying on him. Despite her doubts, Hanada decides to kill the guy. Meanwhile, Hanada currently has a Kai surrounded. In exchange for his diary, he offers a straightforward game that involves tossing a coin and asking Hanada to choose which hand it fell into. When Akis gives a strong performance, Hanada lets Yuki Teru Amano go. As the future shifted, Yuno Gasai noticed that Akaisa's diary did not buzz with static and tackled him, the gang finds he is not, in fact, a journal user and has been winning the games on pure luck after taking a look at his empty mobile notes. In exchange for Yukiteru's notebook, Hanada agrees to one last game, and the first asks that if Akai's triumphs, they continue to be friends. Although Yukiteru is preoccupied by Yuno, Akai's correctly predicts Hanada's hands, causing the latter to knock the former unconscious. This is done so Akai's can use the indiscriminate diary's flaw, which is that Yukateru's perceptions change the entries in the diary. Mao Nanosaka draws her knife but accepts Yuno's stab for Hinata since she is eager to assist Hinata win the competition. When Yukateru, Yuno, Akai's, and Oji Kosaka depart from the observatory, Hinata sends her dogs after them once more. When Hinata feels lonely and recalls her father's unwillingness to spend time with her when she was younger, Yukateru returns, eager to maintain his connection with Hinata. Back at the observatory, the teenagers all appear, and Yuno makes a threat to kill Hinata and anybody else who stands in the way of her love, whether it be romantic or not. As Yukateru introduces her as his girlfriend to calm her down after she had savaged her dogs, Hinata is perplexed by his act of charity. Using a speaker mounted on one of the dogs, her father speaks to her and informs her that his participation in the survival game is over. He apologizes for setting a poor example for Hanada and warns her that friendly people are not always to be trusted, even if he acknowledges that his pledge to reunite their family was a lie. Kiko Kurusu is implied to be present in the room, with him before a gunshot is heard and the breeder diary announces its owner's dead end. Although, Yuno is seen digging a hole at the beginning of the episode, the focus then shifts to Minin as she remembers her last run-in with Third. Afterwards Yuki is seen waiting for Akis Aru at a bus stop. Suddenly, Yuno shows up and forces Yuki into a bus that is going to a bridal show against his will. The wife of Kigo Kurusu greets them and serves as their guide for the duration of the day. They first get to sample the meal, which surprises them by being so opulent that Yuki says it makes them feel bourgeois. However, they were then taken to the dressing room, where Yuki was given suitably dashing clothing for a groom and Yuno was dressed in a stunning bridal gown, to which Yuki said that she looked stunning. Meanwhile, the chapel ceremony, which is the primary event, is then offered to them, but Yuki declines. Yuno continues by saying that since she had a great time today, it's okay not to do it. Then Yuki replies, it's just practice, and she agrees to do it. The picture cuts to black when Yuki was asked to respond with yes or no during the chapel ceremony. They are shocked to find Akisaru, there when they get to Yuno's home, the only thing he discovered behind the door was a sizable hole in the ground, he admits. After searching her home, including the prohibited chamber, Yuno allows them to enter another room when Yuki inquires about what happened to the corpses in the room and why there is a hole in the ground, to which she responds that she has no idea what he is talking about. This is obviously Yuki's first visit to her house. On their drive home, Akis explains to Yuki, that he merely meant to reveal to Yuno the truth about her own actions in order to calm her, but that due to the state of her mind at the time, she may have had to rewrite her own memories in order to carry on. Additionally, he claims that Yuno is only stable around Yuki and never by herself. In the meantime, Keigo accuses Yuki and Yuno of being involved in the death of Hinata's father. In exchange for an unspecified favor, Kigo Kurusu strikes a bargain with Mining Yuryu, vowing to assist her in eluding the law. Meanwhile, a few days later, Yukiteru Amano is seen walking Yuno Gasai down a dark street, given that he is declared the second to be his girlfriend in order to save Hinata Hino. Yukiteru is concerned about his unhealthy relationship with her. His train of thought is disturbed when the Sakurami City Police arrive to question him and Yuno. However, Yuno grows furious and begins looking for a weapon at the police station while muttering that they are in danger. Before Yukiteru can react, he is led to Kurusu in a questioning room. Yukateru is uneasy. Meanwhile, his alliance with Yukateru is dissolved by the fourth, 
who also has him participate in a game of Russian roulette, Yuno storms into the room, brandishing a stolen gun, and shoots Kurusu multiple times in the head and chest just before Yukateru is forced to use the chambered round to shoot himself. The second diary keeper, who is holding Masumi Nishijima at gunpoint, exits the scene while dragging Yukateru behind him. After that, Kurusu has lost an ear but narrowly escaped Yuno's attack thanks to his bulletproof vest, Nishijima checks in on him, it is revealed that his acts were a ploy to get Yuno to assault him, turning her into a criminal and enabling his investigation diary to track her. After a warning shot, Yukatiru panics and shoots another officer in the stomach, which causes his case file to also appear in Kurusu's diary shortly after. As we can see Yukiteru and Yuno are hiding out beside a hospital when they notice Kurusu's wife from a distance and follow her inside, but they are caught in Minin's trap. However, Minin breaks off her alliance with the fourth after Kurusu demands that she bring the other holders to her while also endangering her life, which causes a dead end to also show up in her diary. Meanwhile, Minin introduces first and second to her two captives, Kurusu's wife and son the latter of whom is afflicted with a terminal disease, they are now allies, she confesses that Kurusu had promised to help her get away from the law if she won the survival game and promised to provide his son a better life. A bandaged Kurusu soon joins the Sakurami police unit as they assemble outside the hospital. Mining Yuriyu is holding Keigo Kurusu's wife and son hostage, and Yukateru Amano begins to question whether it was a bad idea to put his trust in Yuno Gasai. Ninth gives him a grenade and instructs him to patrol the perimeter. Yuriyu makes demands over the phone to Fourth, but Kurusu cuts her off by telling her that his dying son's only chance of survival is for his father to step in as Duas Ex Machina. Fourth orders his troops to storm the hospital, and shortly after, he himself enters. Police take down Yukateru, but when Yuno arrives, Kurusu kidnaps him as a hostage. Fourth releases the boy. After the girl makes a threat to use Yukateru's grenade, Second pulls the trigger with the intention of killing Kurusu alongside herself as a way of making up to Yukateru for being the joy of her life. Masumi Nishijima has cuffed himself to the terrorist when Yuriyu encounters him in the interim. When the bomb she planted in Yoi Kurusu's war detonates, Ninth and Nishijima take off running. Kurusu is holding Yuno at knife point in the destroyed hospital while Yukateru pulls a gun on him. The boy defiantly declares that he loves her and manages to hit fourth, despite first and second's diaries, predicting that Yukateru will miss and hit Yuno. A recording of a conversation between fourth and Kurusu is played, and Yuryu and Nishijima also show up. The former has revealed Kurusu's disregard for the law by presenting the latter with it. Kurusu's right to conduct an investigation is taken away by Nishijima, and his diary is rendered useless. Fourth declares his confidence in Yukateru's ability to prevail in the survival game as he asks Yuriyu to watch over his son and breaks his own diary. The two teenagers go on a joint stargazing trip after Nishijima clears first and second's names and Yuriyu escapes police custody in the days that follow. Aru Akis warns Yukateru not to approach Yuno too closely, but she deletes it before he can see it because she appears to have forgotten Akis. Yukateru questions Yuno about her large bag while they are on the train, but she assures him it is safe. However, it turns out that she is also carrying a pair of human skulls, a lot of medication, syringes, and lingerie, but no other clothing. Diwas considers Kigo Kurusu's elimination in the Cathedral of Causality as Muru Muru prepares mochi. Noting that the fourth discovered his son's terminal illness much sooner than anticipated, he understands that Muru Muru has manipulated the course of events, which she confirms, saying that her goal was to hasten the survival game so that a successor could be chosen before Dewis passed away. She then issues her master a wager, choosing Yuno Gasai as the winner of the survival game while Dewis backs Yukateru. Yuno changes their intended destination while Yukateru and Yuno are traveling to observe the stars. Aru Akis, concerned for Yuki's safety, gets in touch with Nishijima who is able to pinpoint Yuki and Yuno's location as a rundown vacation spot and enlists Hinata, Mao, and Kosaka to look for them. Aru and Kosaka come across various traps set by Yuno as they divide and search the abandoned hotels. While Hinata is duped by a text message Yuno sent from Yukateru's phone, the others are imprisoned in a gas-filled room after they fail to locate Hinata. 
The episode ends with a half-naked, ecstatic Yuno sitting between two skulls, starting to feed a confused Yuki who is bound to a chair. Beginning with Yuno feeding Yuki some beef stew, the episode, through Yuno's surveillance feed, Aru communicates with her, letting her know that he dug up the three corpses from her garden, two of which had recently had their skulls removed. The stress causes Yuno to alter her memory once more when he threatens to reveal this information to the police unless she divulges it, effectively ending negotiations. The eighth diary holder, who refers to Kuzaka as an apprentice, apparently turns his cell phone into a future diary as he uses it to post his will to his blog. Kuzaka follows Aru's advice and carries out the prophecies in his diary by encountering an amnesic Yuno, a catatonic Yuki, and a bound Hinata in the control room. Yuki regains consciousness upon seeing him and remembers how Yuno kidnapped him to keep him safe until July 28. Kusaka is able to release Aru and Mao after Yuno throws the control panel key and the key to Yuki's shackles on the ground. Yuno then takes advantage of Kuzaka's distraction and shoots at him with a crossbow. However, Yuki, having had his key kicked over to him by Hinata, frees himself and stops Yuno by slapping her, leaving her behind when his diary predicts the imminent arrival of three diary holders, all apprentices of the Eighth. Dios Ex Machina calls the owners of diaries to a meeting in his home, the causality of the cathedral, to explain the details of Eighth's diary, which can turn regular phones into future diaries. The fact that Eight's diary is on a server hosting a blog that grants other people future diaries in an experiment where the Kosaka King diary is destroyed is discovered by Yukiteru Amano, Aru Akis, Kosaka Uji, Hinata Hino, and Mao Nanosaka. Yukiteru is hesitant to rely on Yuno once more, so Akis devises a strategy to defend first in the future. To Yukiteru's horror, Yuno pays a visit to the Amano home that evening, makes dinner, and then departs. Ri Amano asks to be informed soon, rather than questioning her son about his recent legal troubles. In an effort to remotely turn off the private telecommunications tower and break the Eight's forces' access to the teenager's diaries, Nishijima brings the young people to the expansive family estate of Kosaka, but Yuno cuts off the estate's electricity, forcing Akis and Kosaka to manually deactivate the tower. As Eight's forces enter the main house, Yukiteru ties Yuno's hands to keep her in check. A pair of aspiring diary owners manage to control Hinata and Mao. The intruders, Marko Ikusaba and Aimakami, come to light as the collective seventh diary owners after the cell tower is taken down and their exchange diaries reveal their futures to one another. In an effort to protect himself, Yukiteru releases Yuno, who is eager to defend the love of her life. As seventh battles first and second in the now burning house, Hinata and Mao are rescued. During the fight, Marco decries Yukateru for not protecting Yuno when she is hurt and mocks the supposed love between first and second by blocking a stab intended for Ai. The two teenagers' diaries are stolen by seventh, and Menin Yuryu arrives to help Yukateru get better physically in the hospital after the fight. Yuno and Yuki have been defeated by Marco Ikusaba and Aimakami, and they were now lying in the hospital. Karu Amano, Yuki's father, pays him a visit while he's nearby Sakuremi City. Yuki is seen doing push-ups while mining, who was sent by Masumi Nishijima to train Yuki for a rematch against Marco and Ai, is seated on top of her. But as soon as his father enters, he becomes envious and begs mining to treat him the same way she was treating Yuki. Minin becomes very irritated whenever he keeps pleading and challenges him to train with Yuki instead, which he accepts. Then, she sets up a competition in which Yuki competes against his father in a variety of events, including pull-ups and grip tests. However, Menin, much to Yuki's chagrin, allows his father to win by letting him engage in extensive cheating. Yuki and his father are instructed to sprint to the top of a mountain close to Sakuremi City as the final test. At first, Yuki easily outruns his father, to which he replies that he and his mother got divorced because of his father's poor money management. He also claimed that he had a sizable debt at the time, but that plans had already been made to pay it off. When Yuki heard this, he decided to let his father win on purpose because he believed that even if he did, his father wouldn't be able to remarry his mother. At the Sakuremi Tower, Marco and I, a newly couple, confront Yuki and Yuno. Aimaikami remembers her past, when her parents left her at Sakuremi Tower and Marco Ikusaba 
took her to mother's village. At school, the two became closer, and they made plans to wed at the tower where they first met. However, she was gagged before Marco could save her after falling for a prank pulled by her classmates. He killed one of A's attackers during the commotion, and the young woman prevented him from killing himself out of remorse. The two made a commitment to always be by each other's side. Currently, 1st, 2nd, and 7th are engaged in combat as Marco and I take Karu Amano hostage and move to a higher location. Despite 7th appearing to have the upper hand, Yuno uses her fake phone to trick them into splitting up, and as a result, Ai has her throat cut. Karu uses a parachute to escape the collapsing tower. Ri Amano, his ex-wife, who was informed of the situation by the police, witnesses him land and chastises him for leaving their son to perish. He was last seen agitated by her demands and holding a knife. Despite Ai's cries for help, Marco makes an attempt to save his love while they are trapped under some debris. Yukiteru, Yuno, and Ai. He criticizes her for being domineering in her relationship with Yukateru and for hiding behind Yuno while she fights in order to spend their final moments together. Marco, who has been impaled through the stomach, wants to rescue Ai from the debris. The debris is removed with Marco's help and that of first and second, but Ai has already pulled out and passed away. Marco says this is what he wanted, just the two of them until the end, and decides to fall with the tower handing the teenagers his parachute and dying with Ai in his arms. Then, her diary changes itself to reflect her gratitude for Marco's attempt to save her. Yukateru announces his plans to reunite his parents as he leaves the tower and asks Yuno for assistance in persuading them to reconcile. Nishijima, however, tells Yuki that his mother has died when they land. Prior to the current situation, Yukateru Amano had feelings for Mowakaba, a classmate, much to the chagrin of Yuno Gasai who was stalking him, when she happened to see him carrying a love letter for Wakaba. She made the decision to stop him at all costs. She followed the pair as they shopped for supplies for a school cultural festival while decked out in a pink rabbit suit. Wakaba rejected Yukateru, even though she was ultimately unsuccessful in doing so. Yuno welcomed her parents, who had been dead for a month. As she arrived at her house, she described how they would starve her and lock her up in the same cage for the smallest flaw. Eventually, she lost it and locked them up, finding solace in her naive vow to be Yukateru's bride. First bemoans the passing of his mother, Ri Amano, in the present and even begs Duas Ex Machina to bring her back. However, he tells Yukateru that this is beyond his control and that when he fades away, the universe will ultimately be destroyed. First might be able to save his mother and all of reality by taking her master's place, according to Muru Muru. Kuru Amano breaks into his former home, and although his son believes he killed his ex-wife, he is unsure due to a lack of evidence, he decides to steal whatever he wants to pawn the following day after spotting his father concealing a pawnshop receipt. Masumi Nishijima tries, but is unsuccessful in questioning Yuno regarding the skeleton discovered next to her parents' grave in the hole in her backyard. The following day, Yukatiru goes with his father to a shrine and a pawn shop where he discovers that Kuro has acquired a telescope in order to take him stargazing. The man agrees to turn himself in and expresses regret for killing his ex-wife in exchange for Yukiteru and him resuming their father-son relationship. After he is released from prison, he first extends forgiveness and accepts the proposal. Shortly after, Kuro is fatally stabbed by a member of the Eleventh Diary owner's crew. First is attacked by additional agents working for Eleven, but the boy recalls Muru Muru's advice and abandons his principles, stabbing the assailants and using them as human shields. When Yuno shows up, she kills the rest of them. Yukateru makes an attempt to murder Yuno, but is unsuccessful. Second, she promises to be there for him constantly. Dius and Muru Muru watch the action from the Cathedral of Causality. John Vakas, the owner of Eleventh Diary and the mayor of Sakurami, approves the demolition of Mother's Village Orphanage in order to force Eighth into the open. By following Yuno Gasai's advice, Yukiteru Amano is able to gather enough information to identify Eleventh in time for a meeting with Duas Ex Machina, Muru Muru, and the remaining diary owners in Duas Realm. Next, First and Second intend to defeat Eighth and Eleventh, respectively. Masumi Nishijima and Aru Akis are in charge of the ongoing inquiries into the third body discovered in the Gasai home. With the aid of Eighth and her exiled orphans, Yukateru and Yuno stage a raid on Eleventh's security detail. However, 
First and second use the inability of the orphan's apprentice diaries to betray Eighth, who flees the scene with Bacchus, after Bacchus activates his vehicle's electronic signal jammers. Many in Yuryu and Akis arrive carrying important information before Yuno can kill Eleven. Forensics determine that the third dead body is Yuno Gassay's by comparing the umbilical cord tissue left at the orphanage where Yuno was abandoned with the third skeleton. Yukateru Amano is still Yuno Gasei's ally, despite odd developments regarding her true identity. Masumi Nishijima provides Mining Yuryu with information on John Bakka's whereabouts and defense blueprints in the meantime. Eleventh intends to distribute future diaries to all Sakurani residents after connecting Eighth's diary to his supercomputer, Holon Ailee. Nishijima assists Yuryu in avoiding detection when Yuryu is found at the scene and then proposes to her much to Yuryu's utter humiliation. Muru Muru is amused as he watches the events from the realm of Duos Ex Machina. Dios withdraws into a quiet area to rest, certain that she is up to no good. In the exact moment that Eighth's diary is about to finish uploading to the network, Yushida Komodo consents to give back just her diary, and Yuryu and Nishijima manage to harm the supercomputer. Unfortunately, the damage they inflict is only temporary, and the Sakurami locals learn about the new capabilities of their mobile devices. With their own future diaries in hand, Oji Kosaka, Hinata Hino, and Mao Saka meet with Yuryu and Nishijima at Aru Akaisa's request. The five plan an attack on the Quad Towers where Holon Ayu's backup units are housed after learning that they must be destroyed simultaneously. In order to support her theory, Yuryu enters Deus' personal space after making a revelation regarding Eleventh's Watcher diary. Deus tells her that Bacchus played a part in the creation of the future diaries and is therefore able to use every type of prediction seen so far, essentially spying on other future diaries, after allegedly casting an illusion in which he strikes Ninth through the midriff. By altering the entries in their diaries, Kosaka, Hinata, Mao, and Yuryu temporarily gain the upper hand on Eleventh but the strategy is defeated by his right-hand man's assistant diary. A bomb causes Yuryu to lose a hand, Nishijima is shot and killed, and the three teenagers are kidnapped. First and second show up, having evidently used the earlier party's actions as a distraction, and decide to appeal to Bakja's conscience by kidnapping innocent people. Yuno and Yuki keep killing everything they can to get to the 11th, who's on the top floor of the building. Right on the top floor, the media crew arrives on a helicopter to check in on Elevent and find out what they can. Meanwhile, Yuki orders Yuno to keep taking out every guard in the building. He also turns to Ninth, telling her to find a way to bring Eleventh to justice. Yuki and head up to the penthouse of the building to find Eleventh. Ninth stops on the way to let Yuki know she's still pissed off about her left eye. She promises to kill Yuki if the mission fails so he'd better pray it doesn't. Somewhere in the building, Eleventh's guards hold some of Yuki's friends hostage and threaten to kill them. Fortunately for them, Yuno arrives just in time to take out all the guards. Eleventh keeps reveling in his success. Since his diary could read other diaries, he discovers that Yuki and Ninth are headed his way. So he gets up quickly and hides in his vault. On getting there, Ninth and Yuki manage to retrieve a worker's card and open the vault door. Sadly for them, they find the vault has two doors. Yuno gets a message about Yuki on her cell, telling her Yuki was trapped in the vault door. In the meantime, Nanth points her gun at Yuki to kill him since the mission appears to have failed. Yuki manages to dodge the bullet and escape into a dark room. Nanth follows him and accuses him of being a selfish brat who couldn't deal with things that are already in the past. First, Akayuki is forced to hear all the resentful things Nanth had to say about him. Yuki decides he has to change the future somehow or else he'll die. Elevent is seen taking some wine in his vault laughing over everything that's happening in the building. Ninth keeps searching for Yuki in the dark hall not knowing that Yuki was already two steps ahead of her. She tracked his cell to a corner and found out he wasn't with his cell. Yuki appears from behind with a gun and shoots Ninth's phone from her hand. He begins crying and lets his guard down. Ninth takes advantage of this and gets her gun. As she's about to point it at him, she sees a reflection of her younger self and allows herself to get shot, thinking Ninth was dead. Eleventh speaks into the system's PA and gloats. Ninth just smiles, gets back up, and shows Eleventh her trump card. She takes out a detonator, walks into the first vault door, and closes it. Then, she takes out her diary and rethinks her life before pressing the button. All of a sudden, 
the room in between both vault doors blows up and opens the inner vault door. Yuki lets out sorrow at his own weakness. Yuno notices this and finds out about Eleventh's secret room. On getting there, she shoots Eleventh in the head and kills him. Yuki also makes sure to shoot out the entire server system before getting out of the building. The next day, Yuki wakes up next to Yuno and goes about her normal day. On the other hand, Akai's hosts a meeting with the other remaining dairy owners left alive. He makes his worries about his distrust for Yuno known and wonders whether they should trust her. They keep on discussing until they notice weird black metal spheres appearing all around the city. Yuno tells Yuki this can only mean that the god of time and space, Deus, is already dying and so the whole world is collapsing on itself. Someone has to take Deus' place before things get out of hand. A transports himself to the dimension of time and space to ask Duos if the next god can really change the flow of time in the past. As the world crumbles into itself, Akais collapses and appears in Duos' dimension. There, he gets to learn the shocking truth about this existence. Akais finds out that he was created by Duos as an advanced information storage device to keep accurate records of every future diary owner. At first, Akis refuses to believe he's been carrying out the will of a god he hates so much. However, his opinions about himself change when Deus tells him he was created from the Akashic records of the heavens. He then tells Akis that he'll be disassembling him and returning him back to the heavens where he's meant to be at. Almost immediately, Akis's body starts disintegrating both in Deus's dimension and in the real world. However, Akis wasn't ready to give up. He instead activates his future diary and changes it into one meant to change the future of other observers. Dios gets very impressed and allows him to change the world his way. Akais is now free to roam the earth once again. Yuki and Yuno arrive at Akais's house. They find only him and ask for the location of the eighth future diary holder. Akais refuses to divulge any information. Yuno gets annoyed and stabs Akais in the chest. Just as she's about to remove the knife, Akis stands up and removes the knife himself. Turns out he was wearing a stab-resistant vest. Yuki is surprised seeing as his diary reported Akais getting killed by Yuno. Yet, he's still standing. Yuno advises Yuki to keep following Aeth and leave Akais to her. With the giant black ball still rolling in the sky, Yuki locates Aeth and heads there. He finds Hinata on the way who tells him to stop believing he can bring people back to life. Apparently, Yuno has been lying to him. Even if Yuki became the god of space and time, he still can't bring dead people back to life. Yuki stops in his tracks to reflect on what he just heard. Back in Akais's house, Yuno stabs herself with her knife and leaves Akais with two choices. He either leaves her to die and go after Yuki, or he allows her to die while he watches and risks having Yuki think he was the one who killed her. Akais is in a dilemma. After hearing what Hinata had to say about life and death, Yuki's world comes crashing down. He suddenly receives a call from Yuno and picks it. Yuno maniacally screams to Yuki to come over and help her from Akis. Akais, who's been trying to reach Yuki, finds out about Yuno's plan a little bit too late. After receiving the call from Yuno, Yuki accidentally shoots Hinata. Yuno lets out a stupid laugh and begins walking towards Yuki. Hinata's friend angrily gets towards Yuki to tell him to wake the hell up. Yuno was clearly lying to him, but his weird refusal to accept his reality was already overbearing and just plain weak. Yuki shoots Hinata's friend and then turns to shoot Kuzaka as well. He keeps moving forward until Akais gets to where he is. Stupid Yuki still points the gun towards Akais to kill him. However, Akais holds him tight and speaks some truth in his head. Dead people can't kill him back to life. As Yuki begins to accept reality, Yuno gets to them and still tries to get Yuki back on her side. Akais makes her angry by kissing Yuki in front of her. Then, he charges towards Yuno to fight and breaks her diary. Yuno also manages to slash his neck and injure him in the process. When the time came for Yuno to die, she didn't. Instead, she brings out another diary, her real diary from her pocket and gets back to Yuki. Yuno gets to the eighth future diary holder and ends her life as well. He begins to think about Hinata's words and wonders if Yuno truly could be lying to him. Aki stands back up and gets closer to Yuki, just so he could show him the truth before finally dying. Yuno tries all she can to keep him from Yuki, but Aki eventually ends up showing Yuki everything. Dewas eventually fades into nothingness, but leaves his core behind to keep the world in place until July 28th.
In his absence, Morimar reveals her true self and takes his place as god of space and time before the said date of the end of the world. When Dios finds out she's been pretending to be under his control all this while, it's already too late. Meanwhile, Yuki and Yuno get back home after killing everybody they know. Three days later, in the morning, Yuki wakes up in Yuno's dark room and freshens up. He gets out to find Yuno and finds her taking a dip in a barrel filled with water. After bathing, Yuki sits and keeps on thinking about that day while Yuno cuts some wood for their fire. Yuki keeps wondering whether Yuki was out to kill him or not. Things go on normally for that day. On the night of the next day, Yuno finds out Yuki's been avoiding her somehow these past few days. After dinner, she makes a fuss and asks Yuki why he's acting that way to her. Yuki doesn't tell her anything. Instead, he gets to bed thinking whether Yuki really loved her or she's just trying to find a chance to end him once and for all. The next day, Yuki steps out early and gets to his former house to remember the good times about his father and mother. He then gets to his former school structure in hopes of understanding his own feelings. Yuno joins him and tells him she only has eyes for him and nobody else. On July 27, Yuki decides to return Yuki's love once and for all before the world ends the next day. That night, they take a bath together and sleep in the same bed. Yuki asks Yuno why she lied to him about bringing his parents back to life. Suddenly, Yuno takes out the axe and slashes the floor. Then, she apologizes for lying to him and asks him to end her. However, Yuki refuses to kill her. He tells her about the message Akais showed him before he died. In the message, Akais had already figured it out. Turns out they were living in another world. Yuno had already become god in the first one and had gone back in time for whatever reason. Yuno knows she's been made, so she takes her axe and swings it at Yuki. Realizing what's about to happen, Yuki runs for dear life. He meets Murumur on the way and gets pushed to the past. Yuki appears right back in their classroom. The time when Yuno and Yuki first met. In this flashback, Murumur explains to Yuki that Yuno never had any dreams for the future. Instead, she was inspired by Yuki and chose to be in his dream instead. After seeing things for himself, Murumur takes Yuki to see the reason why Yuno wants him killed. In the first world, after Yuki and Yuno killed the future diary owners, they decided to kill each other and end things. However, Yuno had other plans. Instead of swallowing the poison pills, she kept them in her mouth and spit them all out after Yuki was already gone. Now that she's become the god of time in the first world, she tries to bring Yuki back to life. However, that was impossible. In a fit of desperation, Yuno wished herself into a world where Yuki still existed and killed herself in that second world just so she could enjoy some time with Yuno again before everything ends. After finding out the truth, Yuki tries to interact with the Yuno of the second world. Weirdly enough, Yuno of the second world hears him and asks him for help. Yuki gets back to his world and faces Yuno head on. The starting scene shows flashbacks of Yuno's actions throughout the previous year as she slowly gets to see Yuki again and falls in love with him completely. As time goes on in the flashback, the second world Yuno keeps her father and mother's bodies in their basement. One night as she talks to their bodies, the Yuno from the first world appears and kills the Yuno from the second world. Before she draws her last breath, Yuno writes the word, help in her own blood. After ending her own self in the second world, Murmur appears to Yuno and tells her to begin working towards becoming God in that second world. At that moment, Murmur gives Yuno her other self's diary so she can swap it and become God in this second world. Now back in the second world, Yuki asks Yuno for an explanation. At that same moment, the world begins to lose form and the black balls start sucking out everything living. To avoid getting killed in the hubbub, Murmur puts herself, Yuki, and Yuno on a large ball and takes them to the sky. She then explains that Yuno didn't have a choice in the matter. Since her parents were dead, all she ever wanted to do was to cling to the only thing that made her feel human, and that thing was Yuki. Yuki still asks Yuno why she wanted to kill him. Yuno just laughs and asks him what the point of both of them dying is. If they die, there would be no god of time and space, meaning the universe and all in it would be gone forever. Yuno wants to be god again and then time travel to the next world so she can start over again with the Yuki there and repeat history. It was then that Yuki's adamant ears were finally opened. He's freaked out real bad by killing all his friends and believing a maniac. Yuki loses his footing on the platform Murmur created and falls down several feet to the ground. 
Mormur quickly appoints Yuno as the new king of time and space. However, before she's about to name her the next time and space king, Yuki talks to her in his last moments before finally falling to his death. Thinking he was going to die from the fall, Yuki gets saved miraculously by Nenk. Turns out she didn't die from the explosion in the vault. Mormur gets very annoyed and attacks Knight for foiling her plans. As Knight retaliates her attack, Mormur makes a run for it with Yuno and takes them back in time. Knight and Yuki follow that same path and end up in the cosmos for a while before crashing into a building in the past. Thankfully, they're okay. Yuki asks Knight how she's still alive. Apparently, before she died, Knight had appeared before Deuce. Right before he died, he instilled half of his knowledge and power into Knight and tasks her to stop Yuno and her servant, Murmur, from taking Yuki out and making a mockery of his own game. Now that they're in the third world, Mint tells Yuki they both have to stop Yuno and Murmur from repeating history. Their first stop would be at Yuno's house. They have to get there before Yuno does. At that same moment, Yuno's mother arrives home and checks on her daughter in the cage as usual. Yuno keeps begging her mother to forgive for a crime she never committed, but her mother keeps blaming her for all her bad luck. All the same, Elevent, the mayor, is seen creating the diary prototypes for the participants of Deuce's game. When he's done, they move on to the next phase, which is picking the participants. Mength and Yuki eventually get to Yuno's place before their first Yuno. They get to the basement and Yuki finds out Yuno was being fed grass and was choking on it. Against Ninth's judgment, Yuki calls an ambulance to take care of Yuno. Just then, the other worlds Yuno and Murmur arrive with Yuki's parents. Ninth understands Yuno's trick. She drops a smoke bomb and escapes the house with the third world Yuno on her back. On seeing his parents, Yuki wants to get back and see his parents again. Ninth gets tired of Yuki's whining. She takes him to a building and asks him who he really wants to save, his parents or Yuno. The first world Yuno stares into the sky, wondering if she was still fit enough to be Yuki's bride. She quickly snaps out of her thinking and checks her phone. Murmur tells her to check the diary for Yuki's whereabouts. When she does, Yuno begins to have real feelings for the second world's Yuki. She concludes that she's done with the second world Yuki and must move on to the third world Yuki after everything so she can be with him forever and ever. While she's in her thoughts, the ambulance Yuki called earlier on arrives with third world Yuno's dad in it. When he gets to Yuno, he finds out she's a lot bigger than what she should be. Without giving a second thought, Yuno, the god of time and space stabs her dad and proceeds to stab the other medical workers who came with him. Thankfully, Murmur stops her before she breaks all casualty. Meanwhile, Nenth tells Yuki to cut the BS feelings he has for Yuno. When the time comes, Yuki would be forced to kill the first world Yuno. She then stops on top of a building and gives the third world Yuno to him. Yuki thanks her for everything and carries Yuno back to the third world school. He takes her to the classroom where they first met and places her down. Yuki gets a message telling him Yuno was nearby. So he prepares himself for a fight and faces the first world Yuno. Yuno uses her diary, which tells her Yuki's next moves to gain an edge in the fight. In the meantime, Ninth gets to a phone booth and phones Keigo's father, informing him to take care of his son's heart condition before it's too late. At that moment, Murmur begins to bomb the entire school on Yuno's demands. When Yuki begins to get hurt, Yuno's diary begins to report her own feelings. Turns out she was actually feeling sorry for Yuki when she shouldn't be. Yuno begins to lose her mind and returns to Murmur. Yuki finally decides to man up and face Yuno. He plans to somehow take Yuno's diary from her so she can't predict his future anymore. He checks his phone and finds out he's going to die from Yuno's knife. He chases after her anyways and keeps confessing his love for Yuno. Yuno tries to take Yuki out with her knife. Surprisingly, Yuki survives the attempt and pins her down. On the other hand, Mank appears from nowhere and attacks Murmur so she doesn't interfere with Yuno and Yuki. After she's pinned down by Yuki, Yuno finally confesses her love to him. Yuki gets distracted for a bit, and Yuno sends a giant ball of stuff crashing into his head. Elsewhere, Kurusu gets a phone call from Knight, telling him about his son's heart condition. Before he reacts to it, one of the detectives runs inside to report an explosion in the school around town. At about that time, strange things and sounds begin happening in the entire city. Yuki wakes up in his dining room and finds out his parents were still alive. He wonders how all that was possible. Turns out it wasn't as Yuno opens the ball and breaks up with him. 
She tells Yuki she actually didn't exist in the third world, so she won't allow the second world Yuki to stop her from achieving her dream of getting back together with the third world Yuki. She then takes Yuki to another illusion where his first love, Wakaba, loves him back. Yuki tries his very best to refuse Wakaba, but he's stuck in the illusion for a while. Outside the ball, Ninth returns with a knocked out Murmur and gets prepared to beat the hell out of Yuno. Yuno quickly releases all of Murmur's seals and orders her to attack Ninth. All of a sudden, Murmur becomes rabid and beats down Ninth like a dog. In the meantime, the coward, sorry, Yuki tries to adapt to his new life inside the ball. He's seen having breakfast with his people as Ninth gets her ass beaten up outside the ball. As he eats his food, Yuki gets a sensation about a dream he thought he had about him being in love with a girl in a survival game. Turns out our golden boy thought the dream was reality. Anyways, Ninth gets her right arm bitten off in reality and watches the first world Yuno stare down at her own third world self with a knife in her hands. Still in Yuno's ball of weird stuff, Yuki wakes up to his mother and father's call. He preps for school and waits at the front porch for his mom and dad to finish doing their stuff so they could all leave the house together. Perhaps he's forgotten about the harsh reality he's in. After taking down the ninth, Murmur gets back to normal and restores Yuno's father's health back to normal to avoid a huge casualty in the third world. At that moment, first world Yuno faces her third world self and contemplates whether or not she should take her out. She remembers her former innocent self and waits for the third world Yuno to wake up. Once she's up, Yuno tells her her future. She says her mother's mental health would only worsen and her father would be too busy to come back home from work. She also tells her that her suffering would only worsen with time and when she's finally done with everything, she'd have no choice but to lock them in the cage and accidentally kill them. First world Yuno was expecting another answer from third world Yuno. However, Third World Yuno tells her she still believes in her parents understanding her feelings one day. First World Yuno gets very angry at her younger self and proceeds to kill her. However, she stops in her tracks when Third World Yuno asks if she has something or someone she loves. Just about that time, Murmur finds out the casualty is getting a little too cohesive and the source was from inside Yuno's balls. Thankfully, Yuki has regained his senses and is refusing to follow his parents. To stop the future from changing way too much, Murmur tells her Yuno to take out the third world Yuno quickly and take her place. At about that time, the futures of several other future diary owners start changing rapidly, starting from the sixth diary owner, and then the fifth and the others follow. Dewis of the third world finds out about the happenings of the first world and decides to not to play the game again. This is clearly a big problem for Murmur and Yuno as no game would mean no meeting Yuki and repeating history. Yuno gets back to her senses and raises her knife to take out her younger self. However, her father, whom Murmur saved earlier on, receives the stab for her and gets wounded. Just then, Yuno's mom joins them and becomes sober. Yuki also says goodbye to his parents at the ball and gets back to real life. On the other hand, Yuno still refuses to cave into her defeat. Instead, she decides to kill all three of them and launches herself towards them. Kurushu appears just in time and shoots Yuno to stop her from committing another crime. Before the shot hits her, Murmur from the second world breaks herself out of her seal and catches the bullet. Then, she faces herself from the first world and captures her. Yuki also gets back to the real world and hugs you tightly. As Yuno cries out, Yuki asks Yuno to stab him so they can both return to their own world. However, Yuno stabs herself and kisses Yuki before dying. Now that all diary owners are dead and gone, Murmur declares Yuki as the winner of the game. She transports him back to the second world to stop its total destruction. A few years later, Mank appears to have stayed in the third world. She now has a family with Nishijima, and they have two lovely kids. As the series comes to an end, every future diary owner in the third world lives on to have wonderful lives free of the god of time and space and any weird games. Third World Yuno also gets to live a nice life with her family. She even buys herself a new cell phone with a good diary on it. 10,000 years later, Second World Yuki never moved on. Since his world is totally destroyed, he remains the only human in the Second World as he sulks and waits for a new world to begin. In the very final moments, Yuki decides to create a new world.